Warning, people who are offended by profanity need to fuck off. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by the internet. The internet, probably not worth it in the long run. And now, The Scathing Atheist. This is Anne. And this is Richard in Louisville, Kentucky. Apparently, a small number of our ancestors had bad kidneys. We're pretty sure this situation developed through the millennia due to natural selection. It does seem unnatural that people would select bad kidney people, but Anne seems to have selected Richard nonetheless. Richard needs a kidney. Please go to uchealth.donorscreen.org to see if you could be a living donor. And yes, we did evolve from filthy monkey people. It's September 8th. And it's Britney, bitch. Britney Spears said she's an atheist. Yeah. No, she's she's, <laughs> she's probably listening, honestly, if you think about Big it. Fan. I'm No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. And from Bada Bing, New Jersey and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Canada hasn't learned its lesson about entrusting kids to religious authorities yet. Texas lawmakers throw Chaz Stevens into the briar patch, but this time for real seas. And Eric Hovind will show us all the conviction that we've come to expect from his convict ass family. But first, the diatribe. So, yeah, you, me, and Britney Spears. I mean, Eli already spilled the beans a bit in the intro, but uh, and you probably already heard. But as of a now deleted Instagram post on Monday, Brittany has joined our ranks, immediately becoming the most high profile atheist this side of China. And look, we, we don't generally spend a lot of time on this show talking about celebrity gossip. You know, Generally speaking, it doesn't really matter which celebrities are atheists and which are Christian, unless the Christian ones belong to homophobic churches and then get cast as the voice of fucking Mario, despite not sounding anything like Mario for some stupid fucking reason. But in Britney's case, I feel like it does matter. And for a couple of reasons, right? The first is simply her visibility. Right? In her prime, she was probably one of the most beloved celebrities in the fucking world. Her fan base, or at least her former fan base, spans the political and economic spectrum. Hearing her use the word atheist stands to have a real impact on a lot of those people. But there's another aspect of this that makes it worth talking about in the diatribe, and and that's been the response within the atheist movement. See, the context around this matters. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole backstory of all Britney Spears shit because odds are overwhelmingly in favor of you knowing more about it than me going into this. But suffice to say, she's been through a lot of fucked up shit with some next level family drama stuff. And in the Instagram story, she was responding to interviews with her estranged family about that stuff when she said, quote, God would not allow that to happen to me if a God existed. I don't believe in God anymore because of the way my children and my family have treated me. There is nothing to believe anymore. I'm an atheist, y'all. Now, I would imagine that many of you hear that and your first reaction is to is to wince a little bit, right? I mean, it, it does kind of reek of the cancer mom origin story we so often see in Christian movies and TV shows. And it plays right into that stereotype that Christians have about us that says we're only professing our atheism because we're mad at God, because some terrible thing happened in our past. And if we could just be made to understand why God would put us through that, we would rush back into the arms of Mother Church. And if that wince was your first response, rest assured that you weren't alone. Okay, a lot of prominent atheist voices chimed in with exactly that message on Twitter and Instagram and their blogs, etc. A lot of people felt the need to clarify that while they're very sorry for all the terrible shit that Britney's been through with her family, presenting atheism as though it were a trauma response undermines the logical underpinnings behind the non-believers worldview. Most atheists, according to these responses, shed their God belief not for emotional reasons, but for intellectual ones. And while I am sympathetic to the instinct that leads to this response, I think it's worth pointing out that this response also plays into a problematic stereotype about atheists. And and not the one that we're cold and logical, but rather the one that says that we're incapable of recognizing the emotional impetus behind our actions. I mean, I, I think that we all know that most religious people would also tell you that they arrived at their beliefs through a logical consideration of the facts. They're wrong in this instance, but they're no wronger than we are when we pretend that emotional trauma and anger at the circumstances doesn't drive people to atheism. I mean, if you think about it, most people who leave religion, like the logical rejection comes way before the admission of atheism. 
The whole concept of a crisis of faith is born out of this need to deal with the ubiquity of believers finding themselves unable to pound the round peg into the square hole anymore, right? Whole industries exist to deal with the rampant logical inconsistencies that religious people have to reconcile themselves to. And apologists for Christianity are rife with get out of jail free phrases like, you know, you well, I guess you're gonna have to talk to God about that or the Lord works in mysterious ways, all that kind of shit. Right? All it takes is one glance around a creationist museum, or preferably save your money and you know just look around the website of one to see that illogic isn't the universal tipping point we so often pretend it to be on this subject right so so yeah a lot of people come to atheism by way of anger by way of betrayal you, many of you listening even some of you who would say you know that you got here through a purely logical and dispassionate review of the evidence were only driven to look at that evidence with an open mind in the first place because of some traumatic event that a loving god would never have put you through as a species, we tend to be terrible at parsing out which parts of our conclusions come from emotion and which come from logic. And if you don't believe me, by the way, try arguing with virtually any man about virtually any topic, right? But we're emotional beings. I mean, me personally, like I cry at three out of four Christmas commercials and I scream at misleading street signs. So I, I know this is no great revelation about me, but it may be something that you or an atheist you know needs to be reminded of. When we pretend that our decisions were made in some intellectual vacuum, some nether realm devoid of emotion, we're lying to ourselves and the people around us. It's literally impossible for that to be true. That's not how brains work. Claiming otherwise gives the religious people another reason to dismiss our claims. But if we admit that we first started questioning God's existence because of what he did to our dog or to our grandma or to our relationship or whatever, sure, maybe we're opening ourselves up to some really annoying apologetics, but we're also being honest with the apologist. We're giving them more reason to connect with our journey and more likelihood of seeing a reflection of their own journey somewhere along the way. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is the Statler to my Waldorf, Eli Bosnick. Eli, are you ready to heckle? If you're implying that I'm a gay icon, then yes, I am. And yes, we are. There you go. In our lead story tonight, Christianity prioritizes bigotry over practically everything. And just in case that sounds a bit excessive to you, like I'm being hyperbolic, I have two documented headlines about them choosing it over food and money this week. <laughs> now, of course, to be fair, it's both better and worse than I'm making it sound, because ultimately these Christian leaders weren't choosing between bigotry and their food and money, but rather that of the children in their care. Yeah, to be clear, these stories are about Christians choosing bigotry, the thing they pretend their religion isn't about, overfeeding the poor and hungry. Yes. The thing they do pretend their religion is about. It's a doozy for us yeah. here at the Scathing Atheist, right. let me tell you. And it's a twofer. So, okay, <laughs> we're going to start in Maine, where the recent SCOTUS abomination in Carson v. Macon threatens to force Maine's taxpayers to fund religious schools. As you recall, this was the case where Christian schools sued the state for excluding them from tuition reimbursement programs. Now, ultimately, the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional to reject them based solely on their religious nature. That prompted Sonia Sotomayor to point out in her dissent that the court literally just said separation of church and state was a constitutional violation. <laughs> but since faith based is just a synonym for bigoted, Maine lawmakers swapped out those phrases in the law and effectively reversed the court's decision. So instead of forbidding religious schools for being religious, they just forbade any school that discriminated in hiring based on gender identity and sexual orientation. And holy shit, if it didn't have the same damn result. Jesus. Hey, if you could be excluded based on your own exclusion. Good. Yes. Nailed it, everybody. Right. So, yeah. So when the state said, hey, stop being bigots and we'll give you that money, only one religious school in the entire fucking state of Maine took them up on it. And honestly, that school is still in the review process, right? It might turn <laughs> out that they don't qualify either. The other ones just weren't even willing to submit a fucking form. But the end result of the Maine legislature's game of bigot chicken was Christianity crashing and burning. Now, that being said, the making decision didn't only affect Maine. And more than half of U.S. states have no laws at all against LGBTQ discrimination and hiring. So mm. while this might have worked out OK in Maine, that doesn't mean it worked out OK. Yeah. To be clear, as we learn every election cycle, more than half this country would go back to the fucking Jim Crow laws if it would upset an imaginary lesbian dance class. Right. So. Yes. 
But their own funding isn't the only thing they'll sacrifice on the altar of their prejudice. We learned last week that the Archdiocese of St. Louis ordered all of their private schools to stop participating in the federal government's national school lunch program, lest they be forced to stop discriminating against LGBTQ students. So when faced with the option of updating their worldview to one from this century or allowing literally thousands of children to go hungry, they opted for the latter. Yeah. And quick clarification, because some of you might be thinking, oh, they're going to fund those lunches themselves or they're replacing the programs. No, nope. nope. They were just like, we choose child famine. Right. Right. Hunger strike doesn't have the same ring when it's a different person when you're that you're doing it. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, as it turns out, the archdiocese's fear turned out to be unjustified in this case. This all stems from the Biden administration's move to shift the interpretation of Title IX back to the one that we used under the Obama administration. So that's the provision that bans gender discrimination in schools. And under Obama, that was rightly expanded to include gender identity. It was reversed under Trump and then reverse reversed it's versed i guess i don't know under <laughs> under joe biden slide to the left yeah but the usda clarified that this would not affect the school lunch program because even though the moral paragons of the catholic church are willing to sacrifice the health and nutrition of innocent children over this the biden administration isn't and what's more by the way they clarified this well before the archdiocese made this change. Like there was a lawsuit about it. And in the lawsuit, they said, we already clarified that this isn't a fucking thing. And that was before this. So apparently the St. Louis archdiocese is too damn ignorant to ignorant correctly. And I guess that'll come as a surprise to nobody. <laughs> Never mind. I'm being redundant. They declare apropos. We will starve these children. You know, you didn't have to announce that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we will starve these children. Oh. <laughs> And in baptismal font of knowledge news, parents of over 100 students at Northwood Temple Academy, a Christian school in Fayetteville, North Carolina, received some rather unpleasant news this week. And no, it's not that their kids are getting an education optional education by going to a Christian school. <laughs> it's that without their permission or foreknowledge, the school had baptized over 100 students without their families in attendance. Huh. So, well, you know, the good, if the Reformation taught us anything, is that Christians all agree on the proper method and timing of baptism. It's never controversial. I'm sure this will be fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the process of baptism, either because you escaped a sane religion or you were never part of a dunk cult, whatever it is, baptism actually a pretty big deal for a lot of Christian denominations. It's a ceremony that often includes someone's full family, takes place in the family church, and, importantly worth noting, signifies that that person isn't going to burn in hell if they die anymore. In short, this is like hearing that school went ahead and threw your kid their bar mitzvah in between third and fourth period without telling you. Right. Oh, we knew we had a first communion and after gym. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of fucked up, though, that the chief complaint about a farcical aquatic ceremony that binds children to a religion they can't possibly understand is that they couldn't be there to join in on the fun. Right. I missed it. Yeah, I missed it. Yeah, so as you may have guessed, the parents are none too pleased at this turn of events. But don't worry, the principal of the school has a not at all terrifying explanation. <laughs> you see, she was swept up in the Holy Spirit. Quote, several students had given their lives to the Lord during spiritual emphasis week, and they were scheduled to be baptized this morning. But the spirit of the Lord moved and the invitation to accept the Lord and be baptized was given. And the students just began to respond to the presence of the Lord. I do understand that parents would desire to be a part of something so wonderful happening in the lives of their children. And so I apologize that we did not take that into consideration at that moment. I pray that at the end of the day, we will all rejoice because God truly did a work in the lives of our students. End quote. Jesus. Sorry that I did something any reasonable person would recognize to be inappropriate, but the voices in my head kept just urging me on, she said, and then wasn't locked away for her safety and ours. <laughs> he was still allowed to vote at the end of that sentence. <sighs> and look, I got to admit, all things considered, this is a relatively minor story when it comes to the Christian bat shittery we report on this show. But I never miss a chance at a good prank war, which is why I'm calling on you, podcast listener, 
to somehow sneak into this school nope. and start doing Muslim conversion <laughs> ceremonies on these students without parental permission. Look, nope. look, look, I know they may be upset at first, but I think we can all agree at the end of the day, we will all rejoice because God truly did a work in the lives of the students. Well, right. No. So if the spirit of Allah was moving you, obviously they kind of have to, they have established that that's a reasonable excuse. So. And speaking of the major Christian bat shittery we report on, in cease and Exeter desist news tonight, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police say that a July exorcism at the Redberry Bible Camp in Saskatchewan didn't quite rise to the level of criminality, but parents and legal experts disagree. According to parents, the kids exposed to the exorcism are still suffering from paranoia and delusions, and several of them are in counseling because of it. But according to the Mountie in charge of the Saskatchewan Major Crimes Unit, quote, practices like the one reported may be concerning to some people, but they are not illegal in Canada, end quote. Not adding because they're religion and we have to pretend that's real. Yep. Canada doesn't have a spook factor clause in their child abuse laws for clarity. This is about religion. She's right. Yeah. So for days leading up to this exorcism, the kids were kept up late at night, one night as late as 5 a.m., while a camp counselor named Carlos Dorkson told them about the signs of demonic possession and told them that demons were lurking everywhere. He told them at one point that if they ever thought a girl was cute, it was probably because a demon was possessing them. He told them when lights flicker, it's because demons are walking nearby. And then he told the 12 to 14 year old sheltered Christian kids sleeping in the woods far from home. Good night. Sleep tight. <laughs> Yeah. And again, I just want to be clear. If he were warning them about any other form of mystical creature, these parents would be an open and shut legal question. Right. Right. But because it's the one grandma thinks is real, it becomes a tricky one for the <laughs> bounties to solve. Yeah. Right. So inevitably, of course, Dorkson decided one of the kids was exhibiting signs of possession. So he performed an exorcism and in his own fucking words from a YouTube video where he bragged about this shit, the kids were, quote, Absolutely terrified. They were cowering under their blankets, end quote. The camp's executive director admitted that at one point, the kid getting his demons hoovered out looked like he was having a stroke, and yet no medical care was provided to him during or after the ritual. During a camp visit a couple of days later, one of the parents said her kid refused to leave the cabin because he was afraid that there were still demons in the woods. Yeah, was just driving him home. Okay. I understand we left you alone with adults who essentially traumatized you for life, but did you get launched off the blob on the lake? That seemed fun. Did you do the blob? You're crying. You didn't. You didn't let it ruin your whole weekend, did you? Yeah. So you think it's a demon? You think it's a demon? <laughs> <laughs> and with that reminder that bagged milk isn't the only way Canadians torture their kids, we're going to take a quick break and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucid. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. Okay, I know I've been away for a couple of weeks, and it obviously hasn't been because there wasn't enough misogyny to fill the segment. But I don't know. At a time when courts are ruling that teenagers aren't mature enough to get abortions, do I really even need to be here to point it out anymore? I mean, isn't pretty much every honest newscast in the fucking country since the Dobbs decision some version of this week of misogyny? <sighs> All that being said, I'm not going anywhere just yet. Because as much as this country's sexism is in the spotlight at the moment, there's still plenty of it slipping through the cracks. Take, for example, the story out of Wisconsin where the Sheboygan area Lutheran High School, where a teacher was credibly accused of sexual assault, only to be honored as the district's teacher of the year a few months later. The whole story is six levels of fucked up. A few months after she graduated, Marissa Mayer told the school administrators that while she was a student, her music teacher, Matthew Thiel, had groomed her and sexually assaulted her shortly after her graduation. She offered to share screenshots showing a bunch of inappropriate messages he sent to her, including an angry, profane tirade he sent her when he found out that she'd kissed her prom date. But the school did less than nothing. They told her to go to the police, kept Thiel in the classroom, and failed entirely to investigate her claims. Soon after, they named him their Teacher of the Year, knowing about these allegations. Now, since then, the police have been notified and investigated. Thiel was at least charged with giving alcohol to a minor, though it looks like he's not facing any more punishment. And surprise, surprise, the homophobic assholes who's been screaming about teachers being groomers for the last six months don't seem to give the slightest shit about the story. 
what are the odds? Take, for example, Christian hate preacher Jason Graber of the Sure Foundation Baptist Church in Spokane, Washington. He made a bit of a splash in the atheist media a couple months ago when he not only labeled LGBTQ accepting teachers as groomers, but called for them to be shot in the head or decapitated on live television. Because, you know, you wouldn't want to traumatize the children. So, given how passionately he feels about the subject, you can imagine what he had to say about this during his last sermon, huh? Did you imagine it was not a damn thing? Because if you did, you imagine correctly. Instead, he spent his time railing against the evils of women voting. Now, I'll admit that I didn't hear his whole sermon, but friend of the show, Hemet Meta, was kind enough to provide a highlight reel that I've linked in the show notes. Suffice it to say that he argues against women voting and making decisions in general, for that matter, and along the way manages to slip in a bit about the good old days when we used to kill people for being gay. And to give you an idea of the kind of book learning he brings to the table, he closes his sermon by reflecting on how mad women should be that the notion of womanhood has been allowed to be degraded so much. But I suppose I'm not allowed to correct him on account of my penislessness. Anyway, with that assurance that there will always be plenty more misogyny to talk about in this fucking country, I'll wrap things up and hand you back over to Noah and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines, if you haven't been to the Caribbean lately, I highly recommend it. The sea, the sun, and as of this week, you could be gay. As a court for St. Kitts and Nevis finally struck down a colonial era law that banned the, quote, abominable crime of buggery. (laughs) Puzzle in a Thunderstorm has no comment on whether this coincides with East Vacation on purpose at this time. So so now, to be clear, though, you can be gay with or without butt sex, right? Like, I, f- I feel like any time that there's a, like a, a, a with or without butt stuff option, you should opt for the one with the butt stuff. But I, I just, I don't want to perpetuate the stereotype that you have to. Well, I do. We are in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as you may have guessed, based on the old timey expression for butt fucking, the Offenses Against the Person Act was imported from England with the colonization of the island nation and criminalized, quote, unnatural offenses, which included both homosexuality and animal fucking in the same sentence, and carried a maximum penalty of 10 years with hard labor. And while it obviously hasn't been enforced in that way for a long, long time, I think those of us who aren't Supreme Court justices can all agree that even having a law like that on the books is egregious, and we're glad to see it gone. Yeah, well, and and as America is desperately trying to prove, a country can revert to 18th century morality at the drop of a fucking hat, so it's better to sort those things out sooner than waiting for later. That's right, just takes two lazy hippies in Pennsylvania and bam, back to the 15th century. So, This is part of a long overdue string of these types of decisions in the area. This same court overturned sodomy laws in Antigua and Barbuda this summer. But former British colonies like Barbados and Dominica and Guyana and Grenada and Jamaica and St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines still have laws like these on the books. Yeah. And that's sad because like all seven of those places are in the top 20 locations for butt stuff worldwide. That's true. Exactly. Exactly. And, And don't get me wrong. I do admit there's more than a little irony in the fact that we ranked the best places for butt stuff while Heath was gone, but that's what he gets for going on vacation. (laughs) Well, that and butt stuff. Well, right, Caribbean butt stuff as well. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. And in Cracker Backer Hacker Tracker news, (laughs) that actually all makes sense, trust me. The tax-exempt, legally protected hate group Liberty Council is among the dozens of Christian organizations whose data was exposed by a hacker identifying with the anonymous movement. The hacker responsible explained that they exposed the data in response to, quote, a worrying trend of far right and anti-abortion activists aligning themselves with the evangelical Christian movement, hiding their funding sources behind laws that allow church ministries to keep their donations secret, end quote, adding, quote, we decided to bring about some much needed radical transparency, end quote. Yeah, not adding but seriously, shouldn't your government be doing this? Like, I'm a I'm a cyber criminal. Right. I feel like I'm the last person. Yeah, no shit. So, yeah, so Liberty Council is, if not the main bad guy of American atheism, at least a major boss fight along mm-hmm. the way. Yeah, for sure. Act break. Yeah, right. <laughs> they're, they're the one whose uh, amicus brief was cited in the Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe despite having damn near David Barton levels of bullshit scholarship. <laughs> in addition to fighting against bodily autonomy, of course, they're also instrumental in the opposition to vaccine requirements, election denialism, and 
of fucking course, they were behind the Bremerton decision wherein school employees gained the right to coerce children into prayer. But because they're registered as an association of churches, despite being no more an association of churches than we are, they're allowed to keep their finances and donors secret. Yeah, I hate to steal Heath's material while he's not around, but if a hate group can disguise itself as your thing for tax purposes, we probably shouldn't have your thing. Right. Huh? <laughs> or those tax laws. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, this breach was limited only to those donors that use their digital platform and only represents a small percentage of their total donors. But it's still seven years of data encompassing 44,000 people and over $12 million worth of donations. And that's also not all that was exposed from them. The, the hacked records also show that Liberty encouraged its supporters to vote for Trump, despite the law against 501c3 organizations endorsing political candidates. They also revealed a lot of the COVID and election disinformation that Liberty Council was promoting and then weaponizing in order to bulk up its email donations and rake in money from disgruntled Christian nationalists. Mm hmm. Yeah, the hacked information is basically an explicit list of reasons why Liberty Council shouldn't get to call itself a church group. Right. They might as well have uncovered that everyone involved has to take an oath of atheism and that they refuse to meet up weekly at this point. Yeah, no, it's uh, everybody has to sleep in on Sundays. Yeah. And, and yes, admittedly, it is doubtful that anything you know, criminal at least will come from this. Like it's blatantly illegal for a tax exempt group to endorse a political candidate, but they get away with that shit constantly. They brag yeah. about how easily they get away with that. They have a day dedicated to You're right. Yeah, away they with make it. a holiday out of it. And and I'm sure most of their online donors are bigoted enough not to care that the records of them giving money to a hate group have become public. But given the extent to which Liberty Council is hastening our descent into Christian theocracy, I feel like any blow against them that lands is worthy of celebration, even if it doesn't hurt them. And finally tonight in smooth, smooth Chaz news. We got yet another fantastic follow-up to our recent story about Texas's stupid, mandatory, and God we trust posters. Long story short, Chess Stevens and a few other parents are playing not touching can't get mad with Texas's <laughs> stupid fucking theocracy, and the idiots who wrote the law are getting so mad as a result. Yeah, so no, it's like on on the one hand, it's kind of sad that this is what our democracy has descended into. But on the other hand, though, they should have called no backsies and they didn't. Exactly. So yeah. They had that opportunity. Yeah. Get your cootie shot. Yeah. So for those of you who aren't in the loop on this story, last year, Texas State Senator Brian Hughes, who looks like Boris Johnson halfway turned into a Ted Cruz in some kind of wear douchebag situation, <laughs> put forward Bill SB 797, which said that public schools must display a poster or framed copy of the words in God we trust, quote, in a conspicuous place, as long as it was donated or purchased by outside groups. Because, you know, you'd, you'd hate to violate the wall of church yeah. state separation. Right. So I'm, I'm sorry, Eli, I don't want to get lost in the analogy, but like Boris Johnson and Ted Cruz are both douchebags. So like, do you think werewolves just turn into different wolves or maybe you you don't know. No, that's true. They, they could. Now, I, I, anyways, it's, anyways, now that is obviously fucking stupid. The law, not my defense of my bad werewolf analogy. It's, no, it's just pointed out. No, as I said, whenever there's Christian idiocy, there's a man, a myth, a legend, Chaz Stevens, who, along with Texas based activist Shravana Krishna, donated posters with In God We Trust on them, written in both Arabic and rainbow letters. Oh, they're terrified of rainbows. Well done. Mm -hmm. And since these idiots put a must in their stupid fucking law, schools are now legally obligated to accept and display those posters. Well, it's, it's a good thing that they have such firm and well established respect for the rule of law, right? Yeah. Exactly. So this week, Hughes, in a desperate attempt to look even more like an idiot, decided to clarify his law by fiat, I guess. <laughs> yeah. In a letter to the state's commissioner of education, Mike Morath, Hughes clarified that the posters have to say, in God we trust in English, because that's the language he wrote the law in. That's really what his argument was. Yeah. That's so dumb. And, and this is my favorite. Because the law says that they have to put up a poster, that means they only have to put up one of them. No, 
No, so like it's, I, I love that the amendment process in the Texas state capitol apparently works like the weather forecasting department in Trump's White House, right? It's got a <laughs> Sharpie going, no, no, because that part's crossed out on the law. <laughs> yeah, so obviously, as we've indicated, you don't just get to be like, oh, shit, now that I see how people are using my law, I'd like to change it in a letter <laughs> to the fucking whoever, unless you're a Supreme Court justice. Well, right. And this case is headed to court, but this fight is far from over. As hero and legend Chaz Steven puts it, quote, Hughes can say whatever he wants. He can have all his intentions. Hell, I intend to date Paris Hilton. But in the end, he wrote the law, just not a good one. And it came home to bite him in the tush. Bless his heart. We're likely bound for court. Excellent. Game on. End quote. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm sure I'm not the only one who needs a break to process the knowledge that somebody actually wants to date Paris Hilton. So I guess we can Come close on, the Chaz. headlines for the night. Eli, thanks as always. Irish to read dates. <laughs> when we come back, we won't enjoy watching Eric Hovind get hit in the face as much as we expected to. After so many years of consuming Christian videos, I've learned to spot the good stuff from a mile away. There are certain tells, certain indicators that what you're about to see is the best kind of worst, and perhaps none that fill me with more excitement than those four little words comments are turned off <laughs> and that was damn near the tagline for this week's god awful mini so tell us eli what will we be breaking down today we watched night at the ark park the and another thing to eric hovines <laughs> didn't have a thing in the first place <laughs> that was it yeah this is the sequel to the one that you and heath watched the night in the creation museum and eli how bad was this mini? Well, if you love the monkey debunking scientific stretches of the first film, get ready for the hot yoga splits of this one. <laughs> We're going from scientists don't know everything to we disagree about the existence of water in this That's film. A real cl the, what the fuck point was he making in the <laughs> Mars thing? We'll, we'll get to it. So but we open up with a montage of insanity, right? Because... Unless you stay in the bathrooms, there's nothing else to point your camera at in the ARC parks. So. <laughs> yeah, I wrote in my notes. Okay, who had two seconds before there's a full diorama of someone being murdered with a spear? Right. Anybody? In yeah, no, we get Noah's Ark. A diorama is a guy fighting a dragon in a coliseum. That's from the Bible. That happens in the very true Bible. Dragon's wearing a hat, by the way. It's fucking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Also, of course, dinosaurs, right? We get dinosaurs mm -hmm. right away because, you know, why the fuck not? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, dude, your thing doesn't make sense with the animals that exist. Right. Why would you add extra? Yeah, exactly. So, okay. So then we cut to our security guard. The, the character's name is Derek, but this is Eric Hovind playing the part. Mm -hmm. But he's showing up in his sweet. He's like, we're going to get a shot of my fucking charger, right? It's, I, got it, yes. I got it waxed for this. Two movies in a row, Eric Hovind has felt the need to be like, by the way, I have a very nice car. Yeah, very I, drive very... A, I, I drive a Dodge Challenger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's a security guard. He's showing up to work at the Ark Encounter. He drops his keys on the way out of his car like in some effort to spin him around and look cool. And they just keep it. Yep, they sure do. There's no way that was intentional. He's not that good of an actor. No, there will be several moments throughout this where he very clearly tries to do a quote unquote cool thing, fails. He looks into the camera and someone behind it just shakes their head no and he continues to do this thing. <laughs> yeah. So he gets out of his car. He's walking into work and he's like, He's on the phone with somebody and he's going like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to be guarding some kind of whoa, because just then he sees the arc and he's super impressed by it. Yeah, it's his son, Ricky. And he's like, oh, man, this is just like a real theme park, Ricky. <laughs> no, I assure you, Ricky, it is. Who says it's badly made propaganda? <laughs> well, okay, well, Mrs. Smitherson doesn't know shit. OK, Ricky, <laughs> that's why you're a stepson. So, yeah, to characterize this guy right off the bat, he's a guy who went to work at the Ark Encounter theme park and didn't realize there was going to be an Ark there. <laughs> and then he walks into the gift shop. He is every bit as impressed with the gift shop as he was with the Ark itself. Yeah, he kind of gives away the faking it vibe when he's like, whoa, an Ark. Whoa, a series of 
toys and books you can buy. <laughs> Some of which are, are monogrammed. Yeah, right. And and so he walks into the gift shop and Gabby comes up. I love Gabby to death because clearly they didn't have a part for Gabby. And she walked up to him and she says, oh, I can't wait to hear what part you have for me. And they're like, a part for you. you for you? Yes. What part we have for sh- what part don't we have for you is the real question. <laughs> he will Gabby. ask where Jim is and you will <laughs> tell him. If you think about it, you're the inciting incident of the movie, <laughs> Gabby. So he goes off to find Jim. Yeah. Now, Noah, just so you don't think that they have a psychotic break in the middle of this, in the first movie, they made a couple of tall jokes about this guy. Mm hmm. Which explains why when he walks up, he's like, hey, Jim, can I call you Gigantor? And Jim's answer is, can I fuck your mom? (laughs) Except he can't say that. So his response is, sure can, dumb, dumb. And that, ladies and gentlemen, even if there was a God, I don't think I could join the religion, even if it was true, just because I couldn't settle for dumb, dumb when it came time to insult someone, right? Yeah. I would rather be standing there about to be sent to hell by that God of the universe if he has to be like, and you sure do look like a duty head. I'd be like, you're losing this. Just see, I'm the burning <laughs> fire forever. You are still coming out the worst. Yeah. So Gigant or Jim, whatever his name is, he takes Derek on a quick tour of the place. Now, Derek, though, is a little skeptical that a 900 year old man could build something this big all on his own. Yeah. And his response is, I would say, double down fucking crazy. He's like, don't be silly. He was only 500 years when he built this. And he probably hired a construction crew. Hired a construction crew. He Well, first of all, he says, well, you know, he probably had a family that could have helped out and he could have hired a construction crew. And I'm like, OK, so first of all, you're you're saying that some of his family helped him build this and then didn't get a spot on the art. <laughs> right. Which is super fucked up. But secondly, the whole premise of this story is that humans were doing nothing but sinning all the time. Even the babies were thinking of nothing but sin all the time but they still had construction crews <laughs> oh where's that doodly do just hello <laughs> welcome to Marklar's evil construction will you be building an altar or a fuck hut to- oh you want a, you want a big boat <laughs> or, uh, gosh uh, I guess we could do a big boat too uh, our guys have to take breaks every 15 minutes to fuck a dog. Is that okay? <laughs> That's union rules. My hands are tied. Yes. <laughs> Literally, because I'm doing weird sex stuff. <laughs> so, and then, and then it's time for him to show us some of that sweet, sweet geological evidence that they've got. Oh, yeah, baby. So the argument that they're going to make here is that sometimes you see rocks that are curved, right? Mm-hmm. And that happens because tectonic plates, like, run into each other. It's how we get mountains and shit. But they're saying like, no, no, no. Rocks can't curve. They would break if you did that. The only way you can get curved rocks is if the sediment is formed in that curve, which you would only get with a massive flood. There are so many wrongs in that point that I don't even know. Like, I couldn't even get a hold of a thread before it started to unravel. Yeah, it's the, and they're walking you through it like it's a Socratic naturalistic argument that you're supposed to understand intuitively, but it gets side tackled by crazy. It's like, <laughs> well, rocks don't bend, they, and he literally goes, break. And he goes, so if they were going to be round, they'd need to be deposited all at once by a worldwide flood caused by the firmament collapsing <laughs> in on itself, which then vanished without a trace. Exactly. Uh, real intuitive shit. <laughs> it's, yeah. So, and this is where Jim leaves, right? Jim's like, uh, all right, well, I've got to leave for the night, but hey, whatever you do, don't fall asleep and have a dream sequence, okay? Yeah. It's really overdone trope. And he's like, oh, don't worry, I won't. Don't worry, we've got something more overdone for me to actually yeah. use in this movie. Right. So, okay, so that night, Derek is night guarding. This is the other moment where he tries to do any cool thing with an object. Oh, God. Right? He's trying to, like, spin his flashlight on his hand or on his finger or anything. But all he can do is, like, throw it up and give it a spin. And then he gets kind of nauseous because of the lights. So. Mm-hmm. Yep. We just watch him for it because he gets it the first time in this shot, right? He throws it up in the air. The flashlight spins once and he catches it. And he's like, fucking sweet. I'm great at this. And then we watch him miss it twice in a row after that. Yeah. I wrote in my notes, flew too close to the sun. <laughs> 
So he tries to do, he's got like a, a little uh, flashlight holster and he's trying to do quick draw, but it's so slow that you can't even really tell that that's what he's going for. <laughs> you have to infer it. And then, of course, as he's slinging around his flashlight, he accidentally throws it too high, hits himself right in the center of the forehead and knocks himself unconscious. Just like Rodney King Jr. did. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's the official story. No, you're right. It is. <laughs> Two old people in our audience are like, oh, 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 and all the young people are like, Rodney King. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So it's time for us to cut to the dream sequence, right? He, he comes to within the dream and outside he can hear a terrible, terrible storm. Now, the idea is that he's supp- the flood is supposed to be happening and he's in the ark park. So he's like floating in the ark. But of course, they can't like rock this giant thing back and forth. So they just start no. tipping the camera left and right. <laughs> and he runs from one side to the other as though he's being rocked. Yeah, I really wanted it to just turn out to be the time that the ark got water damaged by bad weather. <laughs> no, no, it turns out our giant fake boat really can't handle any water at all. <laughs> so, but he slips and he and he falls and and suddenly he slides to a rest right at Jim's feet. Mm-hmm. Right, Jim is back for the purposes of the dream because they're like, actually, this doesn't work without your character. We need to shoehorn you back in. Jim's here to explain the logistics of the flood. And look, here's the thing I've genuinely never understood. How did the flood happen? The rain came down from the sky. God put it there at the end. We we believe it in our hearts. Goodbye. The fucking level of intricacy with which these idiots have carved out their worldview to make it less and less realistic at every step. Well, right, because every time, every question about how this could possibly happen you have to invent yet another scaffold to hold that part of the story up, no matter how simple the question is. Right. So, like, for instance, in this, he's like, well, you know, the first thing that happened is the fountains of the deep broke open. And Eric Hovind is like, is there any evidence of fountains? He's like, shush, shush, shush. <laughs> so then after the dinosaurs drowned, all the mountains of the world got covered by water. And he's like, come on, man, all the ma- all." The mountains of the world. Well, okay. So here's the thing. In order for them to get enough water in their silly ass calculations, the highest mountains have to be lower down. So he explains that too, right? So apparently there were no big mountains back then. He says that during the flood, chunks of the great continents were ripped apart and then crashed back into each other, creating the mountains that we have today. Which means that in their world, continents float. Yep. That's just one of the many implications. Well, again, that's the scaffolding they have to build to create enough water to get over the highest peaks on the earth. No, I get it. Maybe mountains are like my toddler. Like I put him in the bath. He gets really splashy and excited. You got to <laughs> calm down. You understand. <laughs> the continents are doing that back and forth in the tub thing to make the big wave. <laughs> There you go. Guys, take this seriously. I'm killing all the dinosaurs. <laughs> so, yeah, and then just as he explains all of that, and then apropos of nothing, Derek's like, well, hold on a second. If there are millions of species, how did Noah fit all of them onto one arc? And then we get into some real interesting math. I loved this part of the movie so much. I went down a rabbit hole. Truly, like my work week would have been three hours shorter because I went down (laughs) such a long rabbit hole based on this one fucking scene, this two minute scene. I've read entire books about this stupid ass argument. So, oh, I want those books. (laughs) I want to read them. I just read the page on the Creation Museum's website and it made me so happy. Oh, it's it's just unbelievable. Right. So, of course, that that's one of the biggest problems with the Noah's Ark thing is how could you fit all of the animals on the ark. Well, they figured it all out. See, it turns out there aren't millions of species. Well, okay, there are millions of species, but a lot of them are fish and stuff <laughs> and bacteria. Well, it's, he goes, a lot of them are fish, and obviously fish don't need to be on the ark. And it's like, okay, so all the fish are evil? It's fine, it's fine. fine. <laughs> no, the fish are good. It's the land animals that are evil. <laughs> yeah. Insects Right? Yeah. They could survive a flood. And I was like, why? Why can all the insects? Right. That the overwhelming majority of insects can't even survive, like, in my bathtub, right? Like, 
And he's like, also, oh, bacteria don't count. I'm like, don't they count, though? I feel like some of them count. But in the end, and, and, and then, of course, a lot of them, if you think about it, like, you know, coyote and dingo, that's just dog. <laughs> he's, he literally goes coyote, dingo, wolf, so, animals that are so fucking incredibly different from each other. He goes, those are fucking dogs. And Eric Hovind's <laughs> like, yes. yeah, well, absolutely dogs. But see, Eli, the Bible never talks about species. It talks about kinds. Kind. And kind can mean whatever the goddamn fuck they want it to mean. Am I under so. arrest? Then I can say kind. <laughs> and podcast listener, I want you to take a second in your head right now. If you don't know this game already, I want you to guess how many different kinds of animals these idiots think there are. Because it's so much less than you think. Right. It's so much fucking less than you think. Right. Now, keep in mind, we're not counting fish and insects and stuff. But of all of the remaining, the birds, the mammals, the lizards, all of that shit, there are in total 1,398 kinds of animals. Kinds of animals. There are 5,400 known mammal species alone. And and by the way, as they point out here, they're including on their uh, their list all the dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. All of them. And mythical creatures like Leviathan. Right, yeah. Dragons. Yeah, and unicorns shit. and shit that their Bible says existed back then. But yeah, that's... And he's like, we even have a list. And he's like, oh, I guess we're going to keep way backed off of that, huh? So no one can see what it actually says. He's like, you bet your ass we are. But it it is on their website. And listener, on it, like truly... This podcast could not be an hour. I could just go over this list. The desperation of this list. I was like, I wonder where be beavers are like, you know, beavers are in there with fucking otters and squirrels, <laughs> seals and fucking sharks and fucking, you know, those are all fish. Those are all fish. Polar bears are also fish and dogs and cats. <laughs> Shit. It's it is a I, it feels like I made the list. I cannot <laughs> encourage you more to go through this list as you watch whichever poor intern desperately tries to connect fucking like horse and bee. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then he has to explain how they got the dinosaurs on, right? Sure. Because Eric Hovind's like, well, you you have dinosaurs on this list, and they're very big, and he's like, not the baby ones. So we see. Baby dinosaurs in cages as featured at the Ark Park Museum. Yeah, I really wanted Eric Hovind to turn to him and be like, yeah, but you just said that they were on it for years. Shush, shush, they stayed babies. <laughs> they were forever puppy versions of the dinosaurs. So, And then, of course, Derek asks for scientific evidence of the global flood, right? This is where we get this weird-ass point about Mars. This is the best. Now, I honestly do, like I I kept trying to summarize this point in in a, in a sentence or two, and I it feels like I got it wrong or I'm making fun of him, but I swear this is the point they're making. He shows him pictures of Mars. And he says, "Look, it looks like there used to be water on Mars," and scientists accept that as a fact because they can see the evidence. And now look at Earth. There's a lot of water on it, but they don't believe that all of it could flood all of the continents. That's because they're biased towards <laughs> Mars. Yep, they're biased towards Mars. What? Which, by the way, I'm pretty sure, B B Bill, I don't think you believe in Mars, do you? <laughs> I, I had a moment here where I was like, I'm not sure what your view on Mars is there, buddy. Because I'm pretty sure your view of Mars is like, isn't it tucked into the firmament, the magic ceiling above the Earth? Also, when do you think it had water on it? You think Earth is 6,000 years old. A little backsplash from the flood. I, right there, there you go. Yeah. So now, honestly, like the listeners, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, Noah, you have erred. You have forgot to explain how he connected those two things. He didn't. No, that's exactly the argument he makes. Yes. <laughs> Scientists accept that there was water on Mars, but not a flood. They like Mars better, even though Mars is the little brother. It's the, it's because of their bias against Christianity. That just the existence of Mars in there is just to make this seem scientific, right? Just so they can have a picture that was taken by a satellite. Anyway, so yeah, <laughs> and and then they have to address what a fucking moral monster God is in this story, right? <laughs> yep. 
and of course, the point, as they as it always has to be here, is no, no, no. People back then deserved it, right? Right. The babies and everything they were constantly butt fucking. Constant <laughs> rapist babies. Rapist baby <laughs> is a tough pitch. Also, look, they're a bunch of fucking prudes. And they're terrified of sexuality and they've never been exposed to any art or culture. So their version of everyone was evil is just like people lying on hammocks and playing flutes. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, you guys know you did the Holocaust, right? <sighs> like if you're if you're setting a standard for everyone is evil, I feel like you shouldn't start at party. <laughs> <laughs> fun party well and keep in mind that even if you bought into this argument that all the humans were so sinful and everything the wombats weren't though surely the squirrels didn't need to die <laughs> no the squirrels were who do you think the babies were raping well, <laughs> the squirrels <laughs> but you're blaming the victim here Eli. The gay squirrel no the squirrels were tricky it was a consensual non-consent <laughs> bdsm scene between a baby and a squirrel. Angelo? <laughs> Angelo? <laughs> Angelo, don't draw that. No, buddy. he's like, there's not enough money that. in the world, guys. <laughs> All right. So, and then, of course, Eric Hovind's character, his follow-up to this is so fucking insane. He's like, wait a minute, though. Isn't the world now all a bunch of people sitting in hammocks and eating grapes, too? Like, don't we deserve to be divinely murdered again? And Gigantor is like, hmm, that, well, that is true. Yes, everyone deserves to die, even the squirrels, yet again. But luckily, God has offered us a way out. Ooh. And of course, Derek has never heard of Jesus or Salvation. <laughs> so, but who's going to tell him about Jesus? He needs to go find Gabby. Gabby, the very important character in this movie who we didn't forget to write in. <laughs> so, right. She does nothing in this, right? He sees like a ghostly image of her walking in a direction at one point. But before we can get to that, though, we have to spend like eight minutes of him wandering around, talking to the various mannequins, trying to do shtick. Yeah, he, he runs over to Ham and he's like, Ham, also a word for a meat now. Yeah. Well, OK. So when he says that's a funny name, that's OK, because it's a Ken Ham's arc. Part. I, I like I OK, I get it. I, I'll give you some credit for that, Eric. That, that was that was a great little intro. Oh, there you go. Yeah. But yeah. But so he does this bit for like five minutes, but eventually the ghost of Gabby leads him into the cartoon hallway of chick track bullshit convoluted Bible interpretation. This this Bible interpretation chick track hallway. First of all, it's the way this is the biggest waste of space I've ever seen in a museum. And that's saying a lot because let's be real. Museums are filling up space with whatever the fuck they can get their hands on. <laughs> it is literally they are walking you through an insane comic book. Yeah. No, it's a comic strip and it's about all the doors in heaven and how there was a door on Noah's Ark and there was a door over the they painted blood over the doors in Exodus. And now there was a door on Solomon's temple. And then Jesus said he was a door and you can come through him. And they're like, what? He's like, yeah, yep. the, the, the chain of logic is so convoluted. It sounded like somebody on a bad 90s TV show having an idea. It really did. Yeah. They were going to defeat the aliens from Independence Day any second now. <laughs> it is literally. OK, so there's a there's a door on the theme for God because the Jewish family needed a perfect lamb. And then the doors on the temple. And then my son is a shepherd. And where do shepherds stand? In the in the door of the sheep house. <laughs> <laughs> like you they built a hallway around this idea without once going hey mitch does this suck is this, <laughs> is this super fucking stupid and we could just not do it yeah and then Derek goes and he he's gonna yell at himself so that they can show off their sweet split screen cred I don't know what intern, right? Matt Powell showed them how to do split screen and they were like, this is Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> they were so proud of this. Yeah. So he's arguing with himself about which is right between all of science and a half ass tourist attraction in northern Kentucky. Uh, it turns out it's the tourist it attraction. It is. It turns yeah. out to be the half ass tourist attraction. It's the world's biggest ball of yarn. It's actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's like, but when you hear only one side of the story, it sounds very convincing. And I'm like, man, even that is overstating the case, to be honest with you. What the, what the fuck was the Mars thing all about? 
and then of course he's like, oh, I need to make a change. I, I believe this fucking diorama over science. And just then he wakes up from his flashlight coma. Sure does. And of Gabby's back, right? Yeah. There, she's in there yep. three times, really. And it's funny because he has like a, oh, I believe, I believe now, except he believed at the end of the last movie. So he's kind of trying to do it smooth. <laughs> he's like, I believe. Still. More. Also, more. Yeah. He wakes up and he runs out to his car and he calls his wife and he's like, hey, my wife, remember all that Jesus stuff you were telling me was true? It turns out I agree with you now. I know I agreed with you at the end of the last movie, but I double extra agree with you now. Or yeah, now. and that's where the credits roll. Mm hmm. We we find out that this was shot in twelve hours on a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wow, it feels like eleven hours more than you really needed. Yeah, I, I wrote. <laughs> what would freak me out is if this was like a three month shoot with cameras. Right. Guys. Yeah. Exactly. They're bragging about that, but yeah, <laughs> that's the credits. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's over. There's still 11 minutes in this fucking video, right? Mm -hmm. So the credits roll and I'm just like, what? Are, why is there still so many more notes in Eli's thing? <laughs> but then Eric Hovind shows up to thank us for watching his bullshit. He's like, thank you for enjoying that video. I'm like, that's ah, some pretty presumptuous phrasing you've got going there, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got a little message for us here. Yes. Yeah, he's like, for those of you who are skeptics, and he might as well say at this point, like, and let's face it, we know that it's just the fucking god awful movies guys watching this, but, right? <laughs> he sure hopes that the movie opened our eyes. As he's saying this, by the way, literally thumping a Bible at us. Mm hmm. Yeah, he says, I want with my entire soul for this to reach you. And I wrote in my notes, I want with an honestly embarrassingly small part of my behind for you to see my side of things. So, <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> He goes, you were created by God, which means you have value. I'm like, I already had value, asshole. Yeah, I didn't, you need to, you're implying that I wouldn't without your with your invisible friend, bud. Right. You okay over there? <laughs> Is you okay? Is God in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Are you looking at him right now? <laughs> so, okay. So, it, it, but he explains that we should go to his website and learn how to be saved. And then he ends his little thing by going, and as always, we invite your questions and comments. Again. The comments are turned off. <laughs> well, not your questions and comments, but somebody, <laughs> we like to think about what things you might say. Like, well, you're so handsome. And we're like, I know. I know. <laughs> All right. Well, with that painful reminder that we're even willing to watch Eric Hovind do shtick for you, we're going to wrap this installment of God Awful Minis. Before we save and quit tonight, I want to remind you that if you're not getting up at Eli in your life, you need to check out Dear Old Dads, a secular parenting podcast that he's doing with Thomas from Opening Arguments and Tom from Cognitive Dissonance. You'll find it wherever podcasts live. Anyway, that's all the blessing we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 Eastern time on Monday, and an even newer episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer, newer episode of our half-sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd fall short of your expectations if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for earning the shit out of this vacation. I need to thank Eli Bosnick for making every workday feel like a vacation. I need to thank Lucinda Illusions for occasionally making me take a vacation. I also want to thank Ann and Richard for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. If you've got an extra kidney, and let's face it, you probably do, please check out uchealth.donorscreen.org. You will find that link on the show notes as well. But most of all, of course, I need to thank this week's most mordant mortals, Crystal Yon and Brian, Jared, Dave, Cease, Megan, Zeronian Entity, Alexander, Hadari, Mac, Adam, Just, Ash, Kenneth, the Norwegian Anaconda, Lawrence, Mistletoes, I Aim to Misbehave, Mike, Jessica Adams needs to sit down and work on her book, Brian, Dan, and Katrina. Crystal Yon and Brian, Jared, Dave, Cease, and Megan, who are so hot, fevers get them when they're sick. Zeronian, Alexander, Hadari, Mac, Adam, Ash, Kenneth, Norwegian, Anaconda, and Lawrence, who are so cool, chills get them when they're scared. And Missile Misbehavior, Mike, Jessica, Adams, Book, Brian, Dan, and Katrina, who have so much animal magnetism, you could probably just stick critters to them. Together, these 22 dutifully doubtful deniers of deities decided to dedicate a dollop of dough to depriving doctrinal dipshits of distensible deference this week by giving us money. 
Not everybody has the money it takes to give us money, but if you think your bank account is up to the challenge, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathegathius, whereby you earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathegathius.com. And if you'd like to help, but we haven't earned it yet, we promise to try harder next week. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Martin Clark, who also the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. The whole show's ruined. They really, it is. Let's we record might as well tomorrow. Just give up. We're missing our first episode. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.